or some years ago. And I'm sitting in a hospital waiting in queue for radiation. And uh, there is some guy going around talking to the patients like me, and he approached me in one point. And he introduced himself, and he appears to be a clinical psychologist. And he asked me about uh, what I'm here with. I explained him my situation in very few words. Just I told my diagnosis. And next thing I hear, oh, so you have cancer, right? I say, yeah, obviously I'm in a cancer department. Sure I do. So it's most likely because, because you have a hidden anger towards yourself. And I go, what the? Yeah, but, but let's face it. So it's really what often happens when we go too fast with our like psychological interpretations. And it's important also to understand that in developing of real psychosomatic symptoms, the symbolic doesn't put any input. It doesn't mean though that when we treat the patients with a psychosomatic, we don't have to think about symbolic interpretation, because in, uh, obviously any symptom provides some second gains for the patient. But unfortunately, psychologists who ki kind of all this term psychosomatic much more than doctors, at the moment they have too much flies in their head and believe in this too much and go too fast with interpretations. At the same time, the doctors, when they hear psychologists explaining them what psychosomatic is, they have another problem because they cannot take this seriously. Doctors understand that we speak, when we speak about psychosomatic, we speak about the, some part of the disorders related with the chronic stress, usually. And then there are poor patients there who actually feels actual symptoms, physical symptoms, physical pain, physical suffering. And then they come to the doctor and doctor checks them out and through the patient hopes the doctor will help him. So, but the doctor te tell him, okay, we found nothing. Please go to psychologist because you have psychosomatic. So, and the patient basically feels, we will not help you, man. Go to psychologists, they will do something. For a normal person who are not psych from psychological communities, this is how it sounds. So you have psychosomatic, in, it means you actually made it up, or you are guilty by yourself. So, and this is nice help. So the person suffering already, and you tell him, ah, come on, you are guilty by yourself, so change it somehow. Go to psychologist. This is a situation, this is a problem that we have. So, and to deal with this problem, we have to first understand who we are. The human being is basically self-regulating system. That's it. It means that we have some stimulus, would be psychological or external, internal, any stimulus. So it's transmitted in a body. We have some reaction. Would it be psychological reaction? Would it be conscious reaction, subconscious reaction? or just hormonal reaction or peptide reaction, we'll come down to this. So, but we, you have reaction, which actually meant to reduce the stimulus. If stimulus is reduced, so then situation solved, you're back to normal. And I would like to mention just four of those systems. Nerve system, so it's basic, basically ele electric signals goes all over our body, so transmitting information, sensoric information and motoric information sensoric information from the body, motoric information back to the body so we can act somehow. And our brain basically part of this machine. Another is, uh, uh, is a hormonal system, which is actually related with the first one, but the hormonal system is actually consists of some chemicals which have the kind of target organs and it goes there and regulates their activity. So, and then we have peptide system. So peptides are very simple molecules which produce directly from the DNA, so, and can be produced in any cell of the body, including the nerve cells and including the lymphatic cells. And it actually brings the information all over the body, not that fast as the nerve system, but so a little bit slower through the intercellular space, but it's reached every cell, 
and change the activity of DNA of every cell in your body. So literally, you can fill it with every cell. Different sources say 60. So recently, I, I, I read in, in one article there was 600 already peptides found. So it's a big variety of the signals that can be done. So, and uh, uh, by the way, so many hormones found to be uh, the peptides as well. And the last but not least is the lymphatic system. So, which is basically the system in the body, which uh, actually what it does, it's search for corrupted cells or some external alien uh, 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 substances in the body and try to eliminate them from the body. And so, keep it in mind, please. So, now we go to the uh, psychosomatic arch. Uh, the aim of psychosomatic arch is very simple, to visualize and to help us to understand how the somatization goes. Very simple, as simple as that. Because when we do that, we can actually approach the treatment much better. And uh, first it was introduced, so far as I know, in 1988 by Nosrat Pezishkan on some of the seminars in Wiesbaden. Then Ivan Ivanka Bonchevar in 2012 edited some with uh, like new knowledge of immunology. Then I added some of my things in 2016, and the recent one from Martin Remes 2018, and the, the one that I'm going to represent now, it's the last update from, from 2019. We have actual event, and we perceive it somehow. As soon as we perceive it, CNS react. Actually, our pawns react. It's a very basic part of the CNS. We call it vegetative level. And how it reacts? It actually reacts uh, uh, through the neurotransmission, so the adrenaline not released in the blood yet. It's only released in a synapses. So, and result of this, and exit is excitation. This is the first stage of stress reaction, basically. We just have excitation. So, which should be somehow motorically discharged? Would it be action or shivering, whatever? So, but like, it should be discharged. Because if, it, if it's not discharged, so it turns into tension and anxiety. And if it doesn't discharge yet, or event is not finished, so then it goes to the next stage, so it goes to the limbic level, so to emotional level. So and uh, then, uh, so we have this all uh, peptide and hormonal reaction, and the all body cells are changes, and we change the feeling, and we have impulse to do something, which we in childhood learned to call by the name of happiness, anger, fear. There is no such thing as a fear. There is a complex of feelings and impulses that we call fear. So there is no such a thing as an anger, there is a number of feelings in our body and impulses to act, which we call anger. Because the, actually the task of emotion is to prepare the body and to direct the energy of stress into action. So in the body, it's fear, anger, dissociation, if you're kind of distancing from emotion and not able to perceive it. So basically it's emotions. And uh, how to release it is very simple. You either let it go, you kind of accept the situation and say, okay, that's fine, no problem with this, or you act. If you don't do anything, if you don't beat somebody's face or you don't let it go, these impulses actually convert into physical symptom. So usually in a neurological symptom, it's so to say, not finished moves. I don't know if you ever saw the conversional disorder, it's when people have some spasms in their muscles which have no other neurological explanation rather than conversion. If you don't do anything about this, it goes through there. It goes to the cortex level. So when you recognize what's going on, when you recognize the situation and your feelings, and you interpret it somehow based on your concepts. So you see the concepts here. Basically, psychology starts here. Before that, it was pure physiology. So here, the brain turns into mind. So this is what's happening. So, and uh, sure, this is a level when the conflict can happen, because like, so if there is no conflict, you just act somehow. So, but if you have some concepts which are fighting with each other here, so you want to do one thing and you want to do another thing at the same time, you want to be rich and to feel pleasant and not to do anything at the same time, you have a conflict that actually prolongs this stress. Because the reason for stress can be not only external, it can be internal as well. So you start thinking about this, you cannot make your mind. If you have a solution for this conflict, 
if you went for the psychotherapy for a while, then you just realize, oh, it seems like I have an internal conflict down here. So uh, I learned with my therapist how to solve it. So now is the time I solve it where everything nice. So, okay, forget it. Then it's finished. Then you, you, you have no problem. You just like kind of go on with your life. But if it's not happening, then you have a chronic stress. Our internal conflict make our stress chronic. And this is a problem, because as soon as our stress becomes chronic, we got them all the fun things, mood disorders and first functional disorders, because our adrenaline rushing and our acetylcholine is not strong enough, so we all tense, not relax, and it's not regulating the vessels very well. So we got the problem in all our organs, and sooner or later we have these vegetative symptoms. But it's not the end of the story. Because as soon as we got the impulse to act and we have an explanation for this impulse of action, we have to regulate it somehow. And this is where the key conflict comes to the play. And uh, so it's again a cortex level, and it's kind of level when we self-regulate or not regulate ourselves. And here there can be a few solutions. First, it can be solution. So we kind of understand ourselves, we are conscious about self, we process our, our conflict, and we are fine with this. But if it's not happening, so, and we turn more into the like suppression mode or into like mode where we ignore our feelings, then the chronic stress turns into exhaustion and it turns into neuroimmune mechanisms which actually can be reacting very paradoxically with uh, uh, like uh, arthritis, with ulcer, with all kind of chronic diseases. But there is one more way to solve it. And uh, this is when the key conflicts solve uh, uh, in a way of straightforwardness, uprightness. And then it's go into reaction. And our reactions are actually always kind of scream for help, but because other people don't understand it, sometimes it turns into conflict. Well, almost always it turns into conflict. Let's think about what we can train for this poor client in order to help him to get out from this psychodynamic loop. In the first stage here, actually we can do nothing but raising resilience of the person. Just physical exercises, meditation, breathing exercises. This would be very helpful for patients to become aware of himself, to get in contact with himself, and to be able not only noticing, but naming his own emotions as well. It has been proved by many studies that more precisely the person can name his emotions, only name it, not even solve the conflict. So less probability he has to get the depression and less he goes to the general practitioners in general. The next thing, internal communication. So because basically our, our concepts is kind of our internal ideas, would it be conscious or not? So, and uh, by way of meaning, we can reconsider this. This is what we're trying to do in the talking therapy. We provide the external monologue with the, with the therapist that we hope that patient will internalize and learn by himself so he, he will be able to deal with this. The next one is the time and trust because the only reason we don't trust our impulses and our emotions and we cannot explore them because our parents long ago was not trusting us and was punishing us for that. And the last one is love and care because like interaction and creating the uh, good bondings with the mutual interaction of care is what it, what it would be to build up the proper relationships. Okay, this is it. Use it. Thank you very much for that presentation. To fully understand it, I will need to go through your works, I guess. Uh, but I, um, from what I got from it, uh, I understand that there is a point for everybody uh, in which the body state turns into psychological states and when you name your state in words. So you say, I'm angry, I'm irritated, I'm dissatisfied, and you differentiate between those states. Uh, do, is it so that for a person who has a tendency to, uh, you know, somatize, this ability is worsened or maybe underdeveloped, and it is your job to teach this person to name emotions. Thanks for the question. It's a good one. So, because this is uh, one of the first things we can do. We can just be with the client, so, and listen to him. 
So, and uh, try to understand it deeper. And you ask, what do you feel? How exactly is the pain? Just exactly like Arno explained another day. So this is the first thing you can do and just be there and bear this because for patient it's very difficult to bear these feelings. And if you are there for the patient and you calm and understanding and consistent, that would be already a big help. Second, yes, you have to help to the, uh, to the patient to notice and to name different feelings. And it can be the bad cloud and good cloud, whatever they say. It can, because the, the word is just a word, it's just a symbol. So, so and the last thing, yeah, so, so you have to approach sooner or later the key conflict. If we approach the, those three only, they will be big help to our clients. There are some more things to do, but if you, if you only deal with these three, it will be already great help.